In this video, we are going to see that the Qur'an contains a wealth of information about the world of the occult. Our analysis will focus on the second chapter of the Qur'an, known as Surah Al-Baqarah, in particular, verses 101 to 102. We will analyse these verses from the perspective of history and archaeology. The verses begin by saying, And when a messenger from Allah came to them, confirming that which was with them, the children of Israel, a party of those who had been given the scripture through the scripture of Allah behind their backs, as if they did not know what it contained. And they followed instead what the devils had recited during the reign of Solomon. The classical Muslim exegetes Ibn Kathir and At-Tabari both explained that the Qur'an here is referring to a faction of Jews at the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him, who rejected him despite knowing he was a messenger. The Qur'an rebukes them for not acting upon this knowledge of his prophethood, which is contained in their very own scriptures. They are accused of abandoning their scriptures and instead resorting to practicing the magic of their ancestors from the time of Solomon. There are a number of amazing insights to note here. Firstly, we can see that the Qur'an makes an important distinction between scripture and the works of devils, namely that of magic. The Qur'an states that a party of Jews abandoned Allah's words and turned to the magic of devils, implying that their scriptures are free of magic. If we compare the Old Testament with rabbinic writings, we find that this is the case. The Old Testament states, You shall not permit a sorceress to live. Mediums and necromancers shall surely be put to death. Let no one be found among you who interprets omens. We can see that the Old Testament has a zero-tolerance approach to all forms of magic. By comparison, rabbinic texts such as the Talmud are full of occult teachings. Rabbi Shlomo wrote, I see in the Babylonian Talmud many things which were permitted from the realm of fortune-telling, incantations and witchcraft. These are innumerable. Here are just some examples of occultism in the Talmud. If one wishes to see demons, let him take the afterbirth of a black she-cat, let him roast it in fire and grind it to powder, and then let him put some into his eye. What is an approved amulet? One that has healed once, a second time, and a third time. The course of the constellations and the zodiac has influence as a natural law upon the world, and everything depends upon it longevity, children, and finances. It's clear that the Talmud promotes a whole host of occult practices, including sorcery, amulets, and astrology. We've seen that these are all practices that the Old Testament deems punishable by death. Scripture and rabbinic writings are completely at odds when it comes to the permissibility of magic, just as the Quran states. Another Quranic insight is the fact that the verse is addressing a group of Jews who were contemporary to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and making the claim that they were following the magic of devils from the time of Solomon. Given that Solomon is from the 10th century BCE and the Qur'an was revealed in the 7th century CE, this points to a continuous magic tradition of at least one and a half thousand years. If this really is the case, then we would expect Jewish practitioners to have mastered these dark arts over such a long period of time. This is exactly what we find in the world of magic. For centuries, Jewish mysticism such as Kabbalah and Jewish numerology known as Gematria have been fundamental to occultism. To this day, anyone who is serious about the occult must study these Jewish systems as they are considered foundational. Yet another Quranic insight can be found in the linguistics of this verse. Note the word recited. Devils are said to recite magic. The use of spoken incantations and evocations are in fact a major part of magic. Madame Blavatsky was a highly influential 19th century mystic. She explained that occultists throughout history have used symbols to convey meaning because they feared the real world effects of the spoken word. The religious and esoteric history of every nation was embedded in symbols. It was never expressed in so many words. Why? Because such or another vibration in the air is sure to awaken corresponding powers, union with which produces good or bad results. The ancient Egyptians held similar beliefs about the power of the spoken word. The commonly found phrases, 
magic of their mouths, and spells of their utterances show the close relationship between speaking and magic. The two were treated as more or less equivalent. The ancient Mesopotamians also believed that incantations had to be spoken in a certain way in order for them to be effective. Voice can harvest the power and knowledge contained within a name. The incantation and names contained in them had to be pronounced in a special tone of voice. The word used to describe one speaking in this manner, luhushu, is even different from the regular verb, say, and had a meaning similar to utter, murmur, or chant. The next part of the verses state, It was not Solomon who disbelieved, but the devils disbelieved, teaching people magic. Here the Qur'an defends the noble prophet Solomon, clearing him of the false accusations of magic. Rabbis and Jewish commentators throughout history have claimed that Solomon was a master magician. For example, the Talmud claims that Solomon possessed a magical ring that was the source of his ability to control devils. The Talmud narrates the following story. The demon Asmodeus said to Solomon, Give me your ring with God's name engraved on it, and I will show you my strength. Solomon gave him his ring. Asmodeus swallowed the ring and grew until he placed one wing in the heaven and one wing on the earth. He threw Solomon a distance of 400 parasangs, i.e. over 1,000 miles. With Solomon deposed from the throne, Asmodeus took his place. While Asmodeus was impersonating Solomon, he demanded that Solomon's mother engage in sexual intercourse with him. Once the Jewish council heard this, they understood that this was an imposter and not actually Solomon. They brought Solomon and gave him a ring on which the name of God was carved. When Solomon entered, Asmodeus saw him and fled. Followers of Judaism need to realize that such rabbinic teachings actually go against the Old Testament, which we've already seen strictly prohibits all forms of magic. Rabbis have therefore created contradictions within the religion itself. The Quran clarifies that a magical trinket was not the source of Solomon's power. Rather, Allah himself was the source of Solomon's miraculous ability to subjugate devils and control animals. Solomon's abilities are no different to the miracles that Allah bestowed upon other Israelite prophets, such as Moses. We can see that the Quran resolves the confusion that is present within Judaism. The next part of the verses state, teaching people magic and that which was revealed to the two angels at Babylon. Here the Quran makes the claim that Babylon was a major epicenter for magic. Thanks to modern archeological discoveries, we now know that Babylonians laid the foundation for magical practices used all around the world. For example, astrology is one of the core sciences in magic today. The Babylonians were the first people to apply myths to constellations and describe the 12 signs of the zodiac. Enuma Anu Enlil is a series of Babylonian tablets that represent the oldest astrological writings in the world. The conquest of Asia by Alexander the Great exposed the Greeks to Babylonian culture. They took the Babylonian system of astrology, developed it and spread it all around the world. Another claim being made here by the Quran is that the magic of the Jews at the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had its roots in ancient Babylon. A number of historical evidences, both textual and archaeological, support this claim. The Talmud is a written compilation of rabbinic discussions that comprise the foundation of Jewish law. Two different versions of the Talmud were produced, the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud, with the former produced in the land of Israel and the latter in Babylon. When contrasting the two, scholars have observed that the Babylonian Talmud is comparatively full of references to demons and magic. A perfect example that illustrates this difference can be found in the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well. Compare the Babylonian and Jerusalem Talmudic commentaries on this verse. Here in Babylonia, they interpreted these words in the following manner, male demons and female demons. In the land of Israel, they said that these words are referring to carriages. This supports the Qur'an's claims about the Babylonian roots of Jewish magic, as those Jews who were exiled to Babylon were exposed to and influenced by its magical culture. 
we can see this influence reflected in the content of the Babylonian Talmud. From an archaeological perspective, the earliest known examples of Jewish mystical texts are Babylonian incantation bowls. This further supports the Quran's claim that Jews first learnt magic at Babylon. Professor Shaul Shaked wrote, The Jewish Aramaic bowls also have the earliest examples of Hekalot or Jewish mystical texts. He also find named Jewish rabbis and demons, as well as information about Jewish legal practice. Moreover, the vast majority of incantation bowls that have been excavated in the Babylonian region are written in Jewish Aramaic. An essay on magic bowls states that the largest number of known incantation bowls are written in Jewish Aramaic by Jewish scribes. Mandaean bowls are the second most numerous, only then followed by bowls in Syriac. A handful of bowls in Arabic and Persian are also known. This shows that Babylonian Jews were heavily involved in magic. Historians even go so far as to suggest that they achieved a mastery of the dark arts. Professor Joseph Nave wrote, Magic may have been considered to some extent a Jewish specialization. The next part of the verses state, The two angels at Babylon, Harut and Marut, but they do not teach anyone unless they say, we are a trial, so do not disbelieve by practicing magic. Here the Quran is making the claim that two angels, Harut and Marut, descended at Babylon. These angels are said to have been sent by Allah and given knowledge of magic as a means of testing mankind. Is there any historical evidence for the existence of the angels Harut or Marut? There just happens to be some striking parallels between the angel Marut and an entity known as Marduk. Marduk was an ancient Mesopotamian deity who was the chief god of the city of Babylon. Marduk is the name commonly associated with the deity in modern times. However, it was actually pronounced Marutuk in Babylonian. Scholars believe that this word is derived from the Sumerian Amarutu. The Quranic Marut may simply be an Arabized version of the Babylonian Marutuk and Sumerian Amarutu. Marduk also happens to have been associated with magic as far back as the Old Babylonian period. During Babylonian magic rituals, priests known as Asipu would impersonate Marduk. A tablet reads, The Asipu is the image of Amarutu. Marduk was glorified as the greatest of exorcists. A tablet reads, Upon the utterance of Amarutu, exorcist among the gods. A cylinder seal that calls upon Marduk served as an amulet. It states, By the order of Amarutu, may he who is provided with this seal be in good health. Marduk was also commonly invoked to ward off demons. The Udug Hull writings are a series of 16 tablets consisting of incantations for protection against evil demons. Several of the tablets are in fact hymns to Marduk. For example, by the invocation of Marduk, ruler of Babylon, may whatever evil be removed from the body of the man. May the evil Utuku demon and evil Alu demon stand aside. Marduk was even called the magician of the gods. Note in the following inscription that Marduk is referred to by the name Asaluhi. Before the spell of Asaluhi, the magician of the gods. The parallels between Marduk and the angel Marut go beyond their names and magical associations. The supreme god Ea was believed to be the ultimate source of Marduk's knowledge. In the following Babylonian text, Marduk is said to consult Ea for advice. May my father, the great lord Ea, show you the right and the master plan of Ea's wisdom. He, Marduk, was searching. He was searching there for the supreme word of Ea's command. We can see that the relationship between Marduk and Ea is similar to that of the angel Marut and Allah, with Marduk and Marut both being subservient and receiving knowledge from the higher authorities Ea and Allah. Even the name of the city of Babylon has connotations with the Quranic angels. The word Babylon comes from the ancient Mesopotamian Babilim, which means gate of the gods. This could be a reference to its importance as the site where angels brought magic to mankind. Hence it was seen as a kind of gateway to receiving wisdom from above. There is in fact a creation myth known as Enuma Elish, in which Marduk is said to have commanded the building of Babylon. Construct Babylon, whose building you have requested. Let its brickwork be fashioned. 
Now you may be wondering, how is it possible that the angel Marut was transformed into the Babylonian god Marduk? Mankind has a tendency to deify mortals. This has been the norm throughout history, with heroes and people of great importance being taken as objects of worship. An obvious example is the Christian elevation of Jesus from human Messiah to God incarnate. With regards to Marduk, historians acknowledge that his origins are shrouded in mystery. The scholar Daniel Bloch wrote that, the ultimate origins of Marduk remain a mystery. The surviving historical records do indicate that Marduk greatly grew in stature over time. The Babylonian epic Enuma Elish chronicles the rise of Marduk from hero to king of the gods. Marduk is even said to have taken on 50 names and attributes. For us, under whatever name he might be called, he is our god. So gather round and let us all call him by all his 50 names. As Professor Markham Geller puts it, it is clear that the principal divine authority authenticating the power of incantations was Ea, god of wisdom, whose role was primary. One of the innovations of Odughul was the increased centrality of Marduk as the main god of healing, independent of Ea, and no longer acting as Ea's representative. At least three tablets of Odughul focus primarily on Marduk's role as the chief protagonist, which is a major departure from his traditional role as Ea's assistant. What's incredible is that this information about the angel Marut and its links to Babylon and magic is unique to the Quran. It's not mentioned anywhere in the Bible or rabbinic texts, such as the Talmud. Now the god Marduk is mentioned once in the Bible, however, very little information is provided and it has no association with magic or angels. The final part of the verses state, and yet they learn from them that by which they cause separation between a man and his wife. And the people learn what harms them and does not benefit them. But the children of Israel certainly knew that whoever purchased the magic would not have in the hereafter any share, and wretched is that for which they sold themselves if they only knew. Here the Quran tells us that the angels brought a new type of knowledge, something very powerful that can cause a husband and wife to separate. Now, the Quran does not go into detail about the exact nature of the magic that descended. However, notice the mention of the word purchased. The Quran could be alluding to the transactional nature of interactions between magicians and jinn. Indeed, a common thread that runs through all magic traditions is the concept of working with spiritual entities in order to obtain some worldly benefit or cause harm to others. The magician does something for a jinn, such as praising it or offering a sacrifice, and in return, the jinn provides a service for the magician. Also note the mention of the consequences of engaging in magic. The Quran issues the severe warning that it is at the cost of one's hereafter. The magician, quite literally, has to sell their soul in order for the jinn to comply. The reality is that in order to reach the higher levels, a magician must commit the greatest of evils, which is demonstrated in their philosophy and morality. Magicians refer to the systems they use as the left-hand path. Conventional religion is referred to as the right-hand path. Note what this magician has to say about Islam and the right-hand path. In a few terms. What do you mean by the left-hand path? For semantic purposes, we use the phrase right-hand path to define those religions or spiritual practices that attempt to submit to a greater force, a God, a universal principle that unites humanity together. So you put me and the Buddhists and the Hindus and the Muslims exactly, and everybody else exactly. all kind and, of in one category over here. And, and let, let me clarify. We're the right hand path. The right hand path would consist of, in religions you'd be familiar with, Islam is the most radical right hand path system. The very word means submission. Islam is the most radical right-hand path system. The very word means submission. This distinction between the left and right-hand paths is a very old one that has been recorded as far back as ancient India. The left-hand path is based on two main principles. Firstly, self-deification. Whereas the right-hand path seeks dependence on God, followers of the left-hand path seek to become godlike. The conventional acts of disbelief that magicians take part in, such as calling upon idols and worshipping the jinn, are bad enough. 
But the left-hand path takes things to an extreme. It reaches new heights of blasphemy, with the magician seeking godhood in themselves. The second principle of the left-hand path is challenging normative conventions of morality. There is a reversal of moral categories. Evil becomes good. Impure becomes pure. Darkness becomes light. Followers of the left-hand path intentionally break all taboos in order to reconstitute themselves as a divine being operating outside the laws and restrictions of man. For example, many religions place prohibitions on menstruating women. They are forbidden from taking part in certain acts of worship and married women refrain from sexual intimacy. The follower of the left-hand path, however, will purposely seek to violate all of these prohibitions. Now we can understand why the Quran is so severe in its condemnation of magic. It is a path that leads to the greatest of evils on earth and ultimately the eternal hellfire in the hereafter. In conclusion, we've seen that these short verses of the Quran are filled with tremendous insights into different areas of the world of the occult, including the Jews of Babylon, the ancient origins of magic, and the interaction between jinn and magicians. To learn more about the world of the occult from an Islamic perspective, please download your free copy of the book, The Forbidden Prophecies, at the link below.